All right, everyone. For our final speaker of the day, this is B-Sides Las Vegas in the breaking ground. Sorry, it's been a long day. In the breaking ground track, uh, for our final speaker, we're going to have uh, Yotam, Pe uh, Yotam Perkel. Uh, he's going to be talking about hidden in plain sight. A couple reminders before we start the talk. First off, we'd like to thank our sponsors. That includes Adobe, our diamond sponsor, and a couple of our gold sponsors, including uh, Blue Cat, PlexTrack, and Conductor One. It's their support, along with the support of our volunteers, staff, and everyone else who makes this event possible. Additionally, this talk is going to be both recorded and live streamed, so we ask that uh, all of our audience ensure that their cell phones are silenced so we don't interrupt the talk. Uh, without further ado, Yotam. So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Um, I actually uh, just came back from a trip with my family uh, this Saturday uh, to the Black Forest uh, in Germany. So uh, I thought, uh, more accurately, to say, my wife thought that it would be a good idea to have like a theme uh, throughout the presentation uh, of the forest. And you know, uh, the wife is always right. Um, and she also helped with the design. So, so at least the, the presentation will be pretty, that I can guarantee. Uh, we'll see about the content. So, um, let's uh, dive in. Uh, so my name is uh, Yotam. I currently lead vulnerability research at a startup called Resilien. Uh, we do application security posture management. Before that, uh, uh, I did uh, threat intel, vulnerability management, and insider threat research at PayPal for a while. Um, I'm also involved in several of the OpenSSF working groups around uh, vulnerability management. Uh, we have a presentation in the audience, um, and supply chain uh, security, as well as the CISA working groups around SBOM and VEX. Uh, and I also help organize one of the organizers of the PyCon IL uh, conference in Israel. Um, okay, uh, I'll briefly go over what we'll discuss today. So first, uh, I will cover the importance on the, or the role of uh, vulnerability scanners and SCA tool as part of the SDLC, the Software Development Lifecycle. Um, we'll, we'll touch a bit on, on how they work. Uh, and then we'll dive into the actual research uh, that we did around uh, basically quality evaluation of open source and commercial scanners. Um, and then the kind of the meat of the talk, which is hidden vulnerabilities in uh, Docker containers. We'll show a quick demo and conclude. Um, so first, um, vulnerability scanners and SCA tools are an integral part of the software development lifecycle. Um, and um, basically in the, the current landscape that we live, when we rely a lot on third party code, code that we didn't write, whether it's open source or commercial, um, then uh, this uh, on the one hand allows us to focus on the core business logic, release faster, um, but on the other hand, it's com it comes with inherent risk in the form of uh, known vulnerabilities. So um, that's where kind of the vulnerability scanners and uh, SCA tools um, um, play in. But um, not a lot of people give too much thought into how they actually work. Um, so before we kind of dive in, I want to, to touch on that a bit. So basically, you could think of every uh, scanner uh, or SCA tool, it has two basic operations that it has to perform. One, it has to identify all of the relevant software components in the environment that it scans. And then it takes that information and map that against security advisories in order to determine what vulnerabilities exist in the packages that it identified. So suboptimal performance in any one of those uh, stages would lead, would lead to um, basically um, 
inaccuracy or misidentifications uh, in the results. So you can think of it, basically, every scanner is an SBOM tool. Um, and it's the, while it wasn't maybe designed to do that, if it doesn't do that SBOM discovery phase well, um, then it won't be able to identify uh, the relevant vulnerabilities. So that's an important point to, uh, to remember. Uh, by the way, I said uh, SBOM, um, is anyone not familiar with the term? Maybe I'll... Uh, oh, okay, so I'll, I'll do... I'll do a quick uh, overview. So an SBOM, Software Bill of Materials, basically it's an inventory of all the software components in an environment. Um, and it has a lot of other uh, metadata as well. Uh, but for the sake of this, the, this context, we'll, we'll leave it at that. We had, I had a, a talk in the morning about uh, that, that kind of dove into deeper into this topic. Uh, and I'd love to uh, expand on it more after the talk if anyone wants to. Um, okay, so with that mindset in mind, we kind of uh, went out to, the, to do the research. This is, the, the talk combines basically insights from two separate uh, research initiatives with, with, that we did. The first one uh, is what's, what you see called scanning the scanners. We did uh, basically a benchmark of um, four uh, commercial and two open source vulnerability scanners. Uh, and we wanted to evaluate the quality of the results. And more importantly, we wanted to identify the root causes for misidentifications. Um, and we later on reached out to those tools, informed them of, of the findings, and hopefully we wanted to drive improvement across the board. Because a lot of times we see, we hear people talk about the, the problem with relying on these uh, scanners' results, and this is something that we wanted to address. And the second research on the right, hidden in plain sight, which is more of the topic of this talk, um, is basically a deep dive into one of those root causes that we identified in the first uh, research, um, which is packages that are installed not via the package manager, and obviously we'll, we'll expand on that later. And yeah, you have this, uh, the QR codes for the uh, links to the research reports. Uh, if you want to dig a bit deeper. Okay, so uh, what we did with the, the first research, the, uh, the benchmark evaluation, we basically deployed 20 Docker containers. Uh, as you can see, this is the list. It's, uh, I hope you can see it well. But um, we tried to make it as diverse as possible in terms of the runtimes, in terms of the applications, so that we'll get a, a broader scope as possible. Uh, but these are containers from the most popular containers on Docker Hub. As you can see, uh, some with billions, other with hundreds of millions of downloads. Um, and we, um, uh, we uh, scanned them using, as I said, four commercial scanners to open source scanners. And then we compared the results. Um, and this is... Um, I'll, I'll show what we found. But before that, I want to uh, explain a few basic concepts that are important to understand before we, uh, we dive in, because this, this is the evaluation method that we use is based on, on these metrics. So first, precision. Precision, uh, as you can see in the formula, is the TP is a true positive divided by the true positive and false positive. So in plain terms, this uh, tells you how many of the uh, reported results were accurate. So out of all of the things that the scanner said that exist in this container, all the vulnerabilities, how many of them were true? So that's, that's precision. Um, and uh, the second term is, is called recall. And this, this, as you can see in the formula, also takes into account the false negative aspect. So. Um, in this case, we divide the true positive, so what was identified accurately, uh, by the amount of true positive and the false negative. So what was supposed to be identified but missed. So out of everything that the scanner should have, been, should have identified, what it got right. Um, and that's an important aspect, the false negative, because a lot of times we hear talk about the scanner's false positive, false positive, but uh, which is, it, it, it's a problem because it, it causes um, a waste of time and resources, triaging vulnerabilities that are not relevant. 
which is fine. But in my perspective, I think the false negative aspect is is worse because it, it's a false sense of security. Uh, if you you don't know something is there, then you can't tend to it. Um, so that's the recall. And then we have the last one, which is uh, the F1 score, which is basically a single metric that takes into account those two metrics uh, together. If you want one number to compare like the scanners by, you can use that. So those are the three metrics. Um, questions maybe about that part before I, yeah. Yeah, what's the the ground truth? So, so that's that that's a, a great question. So it's a combination of one. Um, I'll 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 uh, show it in a bit, but uh, you know what? It's it's a good segue to the next uh, to the next uh, slide. So of what did we find? And uh, but I'll I'll address the question. So these are the results broken down by container. So to your question, as you can see, there's a huge variability in the results. So no two scanners agreed on the vulnerabilities that exist in those uh, containers. And you know, even if we got the same number, it won't it will it wasn't the same vulnerabilities. Um, so. So that was the, the first uh, way that we did it. we went about it. So if a scanner says something and others didn't find it, then 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 we have a, a discrepancy and and we um, we analyze that, determine what the ground truth is, what's what should what's the truth, and then uh, work based on that. So it was a lot of manual analysis involved, um, but we started off based on the the scanners. Uh, uh, output um, enrich that with with uh, manual analysis. So, uh, as you can see, a huge variance in results. Uh, we discovered over four four hundred and fifty high and critical severity vulnerabilities that were misidentified across the twenty containers. Some of them are actually in the CISA non exploited vulnerability list. Um, so, uh, a lot of them with known exploits, um, and. Um, on average, you, there were like 16 vulnerabilities per container that weren't dis detected uh, or misidentified, I would say, by at least one of the scanners. Um, and this is the basically the same results, but broken down by scanners. So as you can see, I didn't put the scanner's name, and this is uh, intentional because I didn't want it to become like a, a blaming game or. A, a, uh, pointing fingers. The the purpose is really to just to surface the problems and hopefully uh, drive improvement across the board. Um, but again, you can see that that uh, on average the the precision is 82 percent. So you can say that one in, in every five vulnerabilities is not true in terms of the false positive. Obviously, uh, some scanners in this metric performed pretty well, but. As I said, what's more interesting in my perspective is the recall, which takes into account the false negatives. And here you can see that even the best scanners, the, the best scanner uh, in this category, uh, misses one in, en in every 10 vulnerabilities. Uh, so fails to identify, will not tell you that you have a vulnerability. Um, so, and, and these are the results which you see uh, isn't optimal. Like this is not what I would expect uh, from leading tools in the industry. Uh, but that's what we have. Um, so on average, you see 27% of the existing vulnerabilities that should have been identified uh, remain undetected. Um, and then, as I said, we try to analyze the root causes to understand why that is. Um, and we'll dive into that. So the first thing I want to discuss is the varying uh, ecosystem support. So there's uh, the support metrics of this, uh, these scanners uh, is uh, is vastly different, um, and um, I'll, I'll I'll explain. So um, going back to the force motif, um, so um, you have in the force you have a, a lot of trees, um, or in our analogy, uh, package managers. Oh, I missed the. Um, so app, DPKG, RPM, APK, and you have a lot of uh, like OS package managers. You have the uh, runtime package manager. So a lot, and for every runtime, you have multiple ones. So and the support for the scanners isn't always the same. Uh, another issue is that, that the documentation isn't great, so you can't really understand what is supported and, and what's not. Um, but that's just one layer. 
because even if we pinpoint to one uh, runtime, one uh, package manager, let's say Maven, then even if Mav Maven is supported and it, it's supported in jars, a jar file can have several artifacts that that basically describe what's in it. So you can have you have a pom XML, a manifest MF file, pom properties, and even with those files, the support varies between uh, scanners. So some look at uh, the pom XML, some look at the pom properties, some look at both. Um, and again, no transparency. You don't really know uh, what they do. And this is also just a part of the problem because uh, apart from that. Uh, even the, if the scanner supports jar, there are several ways to package uh, a Java binary. So you can package it as a, as a WAR or a ear file or a car file. And, and in that aspect also, lack of support varies. Um, so this is, this is a, a huge problem. Uh, yeah, so Jonathan. Files, Yes, th that's a good point. So, so it's also important to uh, to take into account where in the software development lifecycle the the scan uh, actually happens, and to look for the, the relevant artifact in at that point in time where the scan happens. Uh, so that's true. But this is just to to kind of highlight the point. Another uh, good example for for the same point is we saw with uh, GoLang. So some scanners support only Go mode files, so you'll, you'll only uh, get vulnerabilities in Go modules, but they, you won't get vulnerabilities for the actual Golang, the actual runtime, which is a lot of times more critical. If you run an old Go version, you will have uh, far more vulnerabilities than in a single uh, Go module. Um, yeah, and th again, these are just a few examples, but this is a main issue that we saw that, that led to the results that we saw earlier. Um, Apart from that, there are other issues. So uh, failure to take into account the context of the vulnerability. So uh, as you probably know, the, um, um, let's take, for example, the OS advisory. So for every OS, um, a vulnerability can be relevant or irrelevant for that specific OS because of configuration, because of the way they package it, because of various aspects. And uh, usually those advisor, those OSs uh, issue advisories that tell you uh, whether in their specific context the vulnerability is applicable or not, and not a lot, not all the scanners take that uh, context into account. Um, so that that is also something that we uh, show and uh, that we identified, and also uh, something that I want to highlight is data issues. So not everything is the the uh, the scanners aren't the only cor corporates uh, because. The data isn't great as well, and the advisories don't don't always agree between themselves on the ground truth. Uh, so a lot of the misidentifications also stem from uh, from various uh, data issues um, and security advisory issues. Uh, also, relying on CPE tends to uh, scanners that rely on CPE uh, or mainly rely on CPE for identification tend to have a lot of false positives. Um, uh, not uh, taking into account the uh, kernel version, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And but uh, I'll, again, I won't have time to go into everything here. But the thing I do want to highlight and focus on is the last one, which is packages that are installed not via package managers. Um, and this is kind of what we'll we'll try to um, to uh, pull the thread on in the remainder of this uh, talk. And this this brings us to the second research that we conducted and. and um, we took this this issue and focused on Docker containers and wanted to kind of show uh, the implications of of this thing in uh, Docker environments. Um, so, again, the forest. When you look from above, um, everything looks great. Um, let's say you have a, and similar. Uh, let's say you have a, a forest ranger that tries to rehabilitate some kind of area in the woods after a fire, and he plants these trees. Um, and uh, you can, uh, uh, in our analogy, this uh, forest ranger is the package manager. Um, so from above, if we look from a high level, it looks like the, uh, everything is managed orderly and all the trees are the same. But if we dive a bit deeper into the, the forest, we can see that the forest floor is full with other things that weren't 
planned by our um, carrying ranger. Um, and as a way of nature, as time goes by, the uh, the amount of stuff that the ranger didn't put there, uh, or the amount of code in production that we see that isn't uh, managed by the package manager uh, grows. Um, and this is this is again something that we we wanted to f to focus on. So. Um, in the context of Docker containers, the seeds for these kind of uh, uh, rogue trees are these four commands, or mostly these commands. So uh, add from copy and run. So I'll just give a, a brief overview. So uh, copy and add are pretty much the same uh, functionality. You can add a resource from your file system into the Docker container file system. Um, and then you have uh, run that allows you to run uh, uh, basically bash commands or uh, execute a command in a shell during the, the build process of the container. Um, and from, which is uh, usually the first line that you see in a Docker file, which is inherits um, a base image uh, for that uh, specific container. Um, and just to give kind of uh, um, a view of how common th these things are, so for example, if we take the run command, a lot, a lot of times we use the um, uh, grep app and uh, GitHub code search to, to find occurrences in Docker files where these commands are being used to pull in uh, resources or deploy resources, not through package managers. So in this case, there's the wget and curl command that, are, that can be used to, to pull uh, external resources and ju just uh, put them, place them in the file system or extract them and then uh, uh, manually install them. Um, so uh, as you can see, tens of thousands of different Docker files, like different containers that, that deployed, employ this practice. Uh, add and copy as well for zip files, for jars, for tar files, for targz, and this is again just a subset of files. Also uh, Python scripts, bash scripts that you don't have visibility into. So people run a bash script as part of the container build process. That bash script can install things by himself. Or if, if it installs them, it's okay, then the scanner will see it. But usually it's not an installation via the package manager. It's simply, again, pulling stuff Pulling them, uh, putting them somewhere in the file system. And the uh, from command is basically, it applies to everything here because um, it's kind of a you know, recursive thing. So it, depending on the base image, that base image can also have the same kind of anti-patterns um, that, that, uh, that we discussed with the other commands. So overall, we identified over 100,000 Docker files, different Docker files that have this, this, these uh, practices in place. Again, it's a common practice. It's not, but, but we'll, we'll just, we'll show the implication of it in, in a bit. So some examples from, uh, from you know, real world scenarios. So I, again, not sure, you can see okay. I'll, I'll, I'll talk it, but uh, so in the first case, we see that the, the main application of the container, in this case, uh, MongoDB, isn't installed via package manager. So if you run a scanner, or most scanners, and, and again, we'll, we'll see in a bit, but most scanners won't report on vulnerabilities that are related to MongoDB in a MongoDB container. So you'll get all the vulnerabilities for the other stuff that were installed via package manager, but the, the actual application of the container, you won't get any, any vulnerabilities on, regardless of whether it's vulnerable or not. So, and this, the, the important point here is the, like the, the concept, because you could, you could scan it today and get no vulnerabilities because there are none, but tomorrow morning there can be a critical vulnerability in MongoDB, and you still won't see it because of the way that it was deployed in that container. Um, so uh, that was true for Elasticsearch, NX, Nextcloud, RabbitMQ, HAProxy, Console, Memcached, HTTPD, Redis, and many more containers that, again, the main <laughs> application uh, is installed in a way that doesn't allow the package manager to know that it's there, and hence 
uh, the scanner won't identify any vulnerabilities in it. Um, the hidden component can be uh, runtimes required for the operation of the application. That's the second example. You can see here, Go uh, using uh, version 1.13, which it has a lot of vulnerabilities. But since it's just you know uh, the binary that, that is being placed in the file system um, and moved, again, this, most scanners won't identify it. Um, uh, the, the hidden component can be a dependency required for the application to work. Uh, in this case, uh, they have uh, uh, both Gosu and JS YAML that they pull. Um, the comment, I think I, I try to enlarge it. Let's see. Yeah. Um, so you see uh, there's a comment, grab Gosu for easy uh, step down from root, and then grab JS YAML for parsing MongoDB YAML config file. So, that it's a conveniency, they pull it in. Again, if these things become vulnerable or have vulnerabilities, the scanners won't know about them. Um, the hidden component can be also a requirement for or a dependency for the build process itself. In this case, we see it with CMake. Um, and we also saw a situation in which uh, the actual binaries are being pulled in. Um, again, not something that uh, the, the, the scanners will, will be aware of uh, because they rely on the package managers in order to get their data, or mostly, uh, or on these artifacts that we saw uh, earlier. So in this case, it's toxic proxy, um, and then they're just um, uh, either executing it directly, or sometimes we saw the source code, this is the second example here, being pulled again from a remote source using this time curl, and then uh, using make, uh, they build it locally. Um, again, the same problem in a different way. Obviously, scripting is a problem. Uh, we saw various installations that are using um, uh, various Python scripts uh, to deploy stuff. The same for bash scripts. Um, and you get the picture. Um, these, these, um, and this is again, it's, it's more common than than it's not. Like it, most containers have some kind of uh, this practice in them. Um, and just to again to get a, a more kind of sense of the the scope of the problem. So we took the 15 most popular containers on Docker Hub. Um, again. Uh, in this case, every one of them downloaded over a billion times. Um, and the, the vast majority of them, again, contain the same uh, bad co uh, you know, anti-patterns. So uh, Nginx, the container application. Uh, MongoDB is the example we saw earlier with the, the um, uh, runtimes, uh, the dependency, sorry, that goes to in JSML, like the convenience function. Uh, Node.js, the same, also installed Yarn. Uh, Redis, uh, the, so again, the Gosu and the application itself. Busybox, the same. Um, in uh, the Python container, the Python container, the, the actual, again, Python, the runtime, you won't get vulnerabilities on because of that, the fact that it's not installed via the package manager, uh, as well as the, the uh, tools like the pip, wheel, and setup tools that are installed in the same container. Uh, Postgres, HTTPD, Memcached, MySQL, they all suffer from the same uh, issues. Uh, and even the Docker container <laughs> um, for Docker does the same thing um, with various installations. Um, so, um, so that's kind of the scope of the problem. Now I want to m emphasize um, the the impact or the potential impact. So we'll, we'll look at uh, the, the Apache uh, HTTPD container. Um, it has uh, in versions uh, 2.49 and 2.50 two CVEs, the ones that you see here, that are um, uh, actively exploited in the wild. They are in, they appear in the CISACF catalog. Um, they are uh, path reverse path traversal vulnerabilities. Uh, one of them was actually, uh, like, they both, they, the first one existed uh, at the 2.449 container, and then it was fixed, but it wasn't fixed properly, and then that's the second CV. So 2.449 suffers from both, and then 2.50 suffers from only the, the, the second one, which is the, the improper or incomplete fix 
for the first vulnerability. Um, and um, as you can see here, the, the, we have the same issue. Uh, the, the Docker file downloads the HTTP tar GZ uh, using wget, then it extracts it to a local folder, and then it builds it uh, from source using the make command. Um, so uh, th that's the, the same problem that we kind of highlighted. And um, as you can see in this screenshot, um, and we can see it live in a, in a bit, um, if I run HTTPD minus V to get the version, obviously it's installed, it's there. It's, it, I won't say installed, it's deployed. Uh, it's there, it's running, uh, or it, I, it, it is, uh, yeah, in this case it's running because it's a live container. Um, but if I do apt list minus A for HTTPD, if I try to query the package manager for it, it has no idea that it's there. So I get an empty list. Um, so, okay. So that's that's kind of the the scenario, and now I'll stop the presentation and I'll show you how it looks like live. Hopefully, if the demo gods will be on our side, you can see the screen. Awesome. Let me just okay. Everyone can can yeah. Perfect. So um, we are now uh, within an environment where we have. Let's do this just so that you'll see. Uh, we have these two containers, each for, you know what, I'll maybe, okay, yeah, so everything will fit nicely in one line. So we have a container for the two, uh, for two versions, vulnerable versions that we discussed uh, for HCPD. Um, and what I'll do now is I'll run a, a small script that we wrote um, that I'll, let it kick. Basically, you'll see here three stages. The first stage, uh, what it does, it's, it scans these containers using three uh, open source scanners in this case. So it's Trivi, Gripe, and Sneak CLI. Um, so that's the first stage. Then the second stage will be running a tool that is called MIX or MI Exploitable. It's an open source tool that we wrote that uh, scans, but it, it also um, depicts the entire flow of the, it doesn't just look for the vulnerable version, it looks for everything that has to be in place in order to exploit the vulnerability. Uh, and it also kind of describes the logic behind it, uh, behind the decision, you'll see it in a bit. And then uh, the third stage will be, uh, I'll, I'll show the actual exploitation. Uh, just, to, just to make sure that I'm, that you'll be sure that I'm not just uh, messing with you and th this is actually exploitable. Um, so let's go over the results. Okay, so it's finished. So as you can see, first section, as I said, scanning. So we have here uh, Trivi uh, found 177 vulnerabilities, but none of the uh, two vulnerabilities that we wanted it to find in this case. Um, same with Sneak but it gave a vulnerability extra, so just for on the house, what's you call. Uh, and then uh, Gripe, also 177 vulnerabilities, but uh, not, none of the ones that we identified. And this is an interesting and important aspect as well. You see here uh, with Gripe 64, this is the version number. So now Gripe, when we conducted this research, Gripe didn't uh, attend to this situation, but uh, since then, they they uh, they support this at least in some scenarios, and and as you can see, they did identify both CVEs, uh, which is good, and it shows that we're we're progressing. But still, most scanners are still not in a place that uh, that they can identify it. And I hope that this is one of the things that will change following uh, this talk. Um, so uh, then we did the same thing for the 240, uh, 2450 container, and again, same results, just this time the um, uh, only one vulnerability, that, that's good, that's what we'd expect, but again, the three scanners, um, a Trivis, Sneak, and the old Gripe uh, don't recognize it. And uh, as you can see, just another point, the difference here in the number of vulnerabilities is strictly because of this, this phenomena, the hidden vulnerabilities, because now that they know, they scan also things that were not installed via package manager, then they, 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 
uh, report on more vulnerabilities. Um, okay, so the second stage is, as I said, uh, am I exploitable tool? By the way, uh, shameless plug, I'll be presenting this tool at the DEF CON demo labs on Saturday, so if, you, if you're around. Uh, swing by. Uh, so it, it displays, I won't go into the tool come Saturday, but uh, it displays the flow and, and as you can see, it did, it did uh, flag the, uh, the relevant vulnerability in the newest version and the two vulnerabilities in the oldest version. Um, so that's that. And now just to, again, for the sake of completeness, I'll run the, the actual exploitation commands for each of the uh, containers, uh, just so that you'll see. Okay, so the, basically what it does is it uses the pass reversal vulnerability just to print the etc password file. So you see that it works on the 2449, and then we have the same one uh, with the other vulnerability, like the because it wasn't fixed properly, this is kind of the, the uh, payload that you have to run to uh, run it. Uh, wait, 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 what did you wrong? Yes. Ah, at the beginning and the end, yes. True. Ah, yeah, I didn't take the whole line. Okay, 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 okay. That's, yeah. Okay, run it again. Okay, works. And then we have uh, for the 250 container, the same thing. That's not the line that I want. Sorry, we'll just finish in a bit. Okay, so here the first one doesn't work because again, it was patched, uh, but the second one should and hopefully will work. Um, and we'll go back to the presentation. Well, again, we need the curl. Okay, 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 got it. Okay, and it works. Okay, so again, pretty simple, but uh, effective way to exploit a vulnerability that a scanner won't detect, uh, or most scanners at least. Um, cool, so let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so what, what we saw here is, give it a sec, um, is again, two actively exploited with known patches, vulnerabilities, uh, from the CISACF catalog that are undetected by most vulnerability scanners. Needless to say, but I'll say it anyway, uh, that the fact that the scanners don't identify it doesn't mean anything in terms of exploitation. Um, and so, so that's that. So uh, this research, the, like the, when I look at both researches, uh, research initiatives, uh, we found um, th this is the amount of issues that we open for the different scanners uh, or tickets uh, for different um, uh, vendors. Um, and usually most of them were, were pretty responsive. I can't say that everything was fixed. As you, as you can see, there's still the same problem. Like we use the newest versions of the uh, both Trivi and Sneak as well. Um, but uh, some were less responsive, as you can see in this message. So this case falls outside of the covered support plan. Therefore, I'm cl I will be closing the issues. So okay, <laughs> if it's whatever. Uh, but we tried at least. Um, so that's, yeah, that's it. So um, I think in terms of takeaways, there are, there are several layers of takeaways from this, uh, from this uh, phenomena or, or uh, problem. Uh, one is for in the scope, in the, uh, for developers or maintainers, for the scanners, and also for, from a security pr practitioner perspective, which is most of you. So uh, this is how I try to break it down. So from a developer perspective, for the folks who are building these containers, um, it's important to, to try to avoid, uh, first be aware of this, this gap, because a lot of times the developer, when it uses these commands, it doesn't know that what it is effectively creating a blind spot for security tooling. It does it because, again, it's what they usually do. Uh, it's convenient. Uh, so just awareness is key. Just making sure, and if you can avoid it, then avoid it. So that's one. Um, and two, from a security practitioner perspective, so uh, again, awareness of this detection gap. Um, and make sure that you have 
wh whether it's tooling or processes in place to account for this gap until uh, hopefully this will be fixed. Um, and um, uh, again, not, not taking things at face value. Uh, be inquisitive, make sure the first issue that we discussed with uh, uh, the support variants, it, it's crucial. We saw that it, it's, it's difficult, there's no transparency, also for the quality of the results, but that's understandable. No scanner will tell you, hi, this is what I don't know how to handle, and this is my false positive rate and false negative rate. So, that, but but it, from your perspective, it's important to be aware and again, not trust those results as you know. Uh, uh, I would say that the, the the in Hebrew the the Torah from the the, the Bible from but yeah, we won't get to religious uh, uh, metaphors. But anyway, don't trust it at face value. Uh, take everything with a grain of salt. Um, and when uh, you're evaluating different tools, if you're trying to purchase these tools, then, then make sure that you take into it, these things into account. And more importantly, focus your evaluation process on, the, uh, on your environment, what's important to you. So if you are uh, developing in Golang and your scanner doesn't fully support that, uh, then, then you're, that's a problem. So build your testing scenario and evaluation process so that you'll take these things into account. Uh, and specifically in the context of your uh, business goals and, and uh, environment. Um, and again, from the scanners, the truth perspective, so we try to raise awareness to these, to these gaps and we hope that, that this will drive improvement. Um, and also, this also comes from, from down up, like from security perspective, if they'll get demands from customers, look, I won't buy your product until you fix this thing because others, we, we see improvement in that space, so that's good, uh, but there's still work to be done. Um, um, yeah, so that's, that's basically it from me. Um, before a question, this is a picture actually that, that we took at the Black Forest in Germany. So highly recommended uh, with, even if you have uh, small kids, it's a great trip. Um, and uh, one more note, I, it's important for me to mention while I'm presenting here, uh, this was a combined effort from my team and we have Ofri and Katya uh, in my team that help with the analysis and uh, uh, the results obviously and uh, unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, and lastly, I will say that again, this is more to emphasize the phenomena, more of the specific vulnerabilities. It, it's more, it's, it's wider than that. Uh, and it's not only relevant for Docker containers. It's easy to show in Docker containers, but it applies to whatever environment. You have an OS and you deploy something which is uh, not through the common uh, you know, practices, not through package managers, you could be creating a blind spot for your security tooling. So again, be aware of that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Um, and, and I think again, uh, as long as the tooling won't step up and, and, and uh, improve that aspect, it's important for uh, the practitioner's side to, to be aware of it and, and, and have the, the mitigating controls in place to, to account for this, this risk. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, yeah, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. If you have any questions, please step up to the mic. Awesome. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Uh, you had mentioned that you used, I mean, I, you saw there's Docker containers you were using. Are there other environments where you can build the software, it can pull in all these dependencies, and then you can scan them with various tools? Or does that functionality, functionality just not work in industry right now? So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I follow the question. You said? Uh, you had showed examples like where the software pulls in, like wget or curl pulls yeah, in yeah, yeah. Like all the additional packages and additional software mm -hmm. that's not being scanned by the code scanners because you're only scanning the... So okay, so so I'll I'll, I'll highlight the um, I'll try. It. Yeah. So the 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 issue is uh, not the pool itself mm -hmm. is the, the the what's being pulled. So if you pull a right. binary and it's not it's not something that you installed 
via the package manager because most uh, scanners rely on the package managers. They query the package managers and say, okay, what's installed? And then they take that and, and map that to vulnerabilities. So if you do that not via the package manager, then they won't know that it's there and then they won't do the part that maps it to vulnerability and they, they won't identify. So it can be in a Docker container, it can be in, in your mm -hmm. average Ubuntu host. Uh, right, right. So there's no way to scan what's being pulled after because the binaries can change on the fly is what you're saying. Like they, uh, they could change in their dynamic. Uh, yeah, so you can, you can, uh, some of the scanners support like flags, you can say scan this thing, scan mm -hmm. this file. But again, you have to be aware that yeah. your developers are doing this and where it sits and, and, and point the scanner at the right place in order for, for it to, to give you these results. You won't get that out of the box. Right, thank you. My pleasure. Hi. Um, hey. So I think a lot of the reason that those Docker containers that you were showing do what they do is that they are upstream and they are, sorry, uh, these packages are upstream mm -hmm. and they are maybe months ahead of the package managers themselves. So is there any expectation that we would really get to a state in which a maybe an HA proxy container would be deployed from like an RPM when the RPM is going to be six months after the HA proxy upstream does their release? Yeah, so yeah, so th this problem can be tackled from various directions. Th this is one approach. By the way, ChainGuard uh, takes that approach. They build the images in advance in a way that, that don't have these these uh, blind spots because they use like the, uh, they take the tarballs, they use APK, and the APK package managers allows you to uh, pretty easily um, uh, build the same things, like like do the same process that you need to do, and then package it in a tarGZ file, and at least it'll let you know that it's there. So that's one that's one approach to tackle the problem. And I think, but it has to come from both uh, ways. I don't expect Docker to, f to fix this. I, I expect the scanners to be aware of that this is the state of the world and, and, and address it. Like Gripe is already doing it. So there is a solution. Um, you can, uh, obviously it's, it requires some engineering, but it's, it's not unsolvable. Uh, so, so I think that, and again, awareness from the, the developer side, the practitioner side to, uh, to push and drive this, this improvement. Thank you. Great talk. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> hey. hey, I'm really, I'm really short. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. This is great. So, uh, springboarding off of this, I think maybe mm -hmm. both of the questions before me are going to tie into kind of where I'm going to lean in, and that is, with what you've identified here, identifying anti-patterns, mm -hmm. can you not then maybe orchestrate something as simple as a set of Git hooks that would be the responsible place at which you would do this inspection and at least alert, like, the, there's components that are hitting the image? Yes. Okay. Did yeah. you could you so, talk about whether you played with that or? If yeah. So so that's definitely an option. We we actually do uh, some of those things as part of our uh, product. But um, but yeah, that's definitely an option because as as you saw also in the example, a lot of the things kind of are, are uh, repeat themselves. So there's again, again there's several ways to handle the problem. Um, but but that's definitely also an option. Um, I know, uh, for example, you can look, Gripe is open source, you can look at their implementation. So for the from command, they just, they say, okay, this is from this container, I already know what's inside that, and then I, I'll, I'll let you know, uh, I'll, I'll add that to the analysis. Um, again, it's, it's not, it's, it's an engineering problem, it can be solved many ways, but it's not unsolvable. There, there are definitely uh, ways to do it, even as you highlighted, you don't have to wait for the tooling. Like you can do, you can, once you are aware of it, you can do, especially for in-house images, for your images you, you, that you need to, uh, uh, do you want to be extra vigilant of, uh, you can definitely uh, do something with, uh, through your CI process or through runtime visibility that will give you the same, um, uh, like complete the, this current gap. Okay, thank you all.